Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss at least some positive results that seem to have come from the recovery trials in Oxford. Now, we have with us Satyajit Rat, who has been educating us about the various medical and the health aspects of this particular epidemic, COVID-19. Satyajit, for the first time, we have some positive news which says trials have succeeded, at least to the only a press release, but the trials have succeeded in showing a significant drop in deaths using dexamethasone, the steroid, which is quite easily and cheaply available. Yeah. So um, this is one of those examples, I think, where um, it's what uh, um, uh, slang would let you call a no-brainer. Okay. Um, in fact, the Oxford University press release itself points out that uh, dexamethasone, which is simply one of a large uh, variety of corticosteroids that are um, clinically in wide use for many decades, um, and all of those uses, one way or another, broadly, reduce inflammation. Okay. Um, if you look at the last three months, there have been um, easily approaching 100 uh, publications that have examined, thought about, tried out various corticosteroids such as dexamethasone in patients of COVID-19. And have some have said, yes, they see uh, an effect. Some have said, no, they don't really see an effect. Pretty much all of them say, we at least haven't seen any bad effects. So there's no problem with trying it out. Exactly how to use it and whom to use it still remains a little uncertain. So the real um, uh, novelty of the news from Oxford, and I hasten to point out that it's news. Um, we have yet to see any data, leave alone a peer-reviewed publication. So this is not even at the preprint level. This is at the level of a press release alone. Like the Gilead science result of Remdesivir. So, um, and, and uh, as we pointed out at that time, it's not surprising given the anxiety around that uh, uh, these releases are happening. But at least the Oxford release um, cannot be looked at suspiciously with the perspective of are they trying to increase their share value and so on and so forth? Because dexamethasone is just a generically available drug. And it's very cheap. Even in India, I think you can get it for a, a oh, absolutely. For 20 is very, very cheap in absolutely. few weeks, virtually. Absolutely. So, and if the claim is correct, and I see no reason to think that it's not, um, then these are reliable, statistically robust results that say that a cheap, generic, easily made, easily accessible, already very widely uh, available and accessible because it's used in such a great diversity of situations and circumstances, drug can provide an advantage in the most seriously ill COVID-19 patients. So this is the other part. This is really for those who are seriously ill, which means, as we have discussed earlier, there is a serious lung inflammation and therefore taking care of that, addressing that would at least help in reducing the number of deaths. That's the basic underlying issue with using this kind of corticosteroid uh, for COVID-19 serious cases, right? Yes, there is there's an interesting little um, uh, wrinkle to that, which the press release, which is really the only documentation we have uh, available to us, points out quite helpfully, that the improvement seems to be most striking in the most seriously ill patients. Those are ventilators. Um, it's a little less striking in those who are not quite as ill, meaning those who are on oxygen but not on ventilators. And it's not apparent, so far at least, in those who are only moderately ill. 
And an interesting issue related to that is the likelihood that both inflammation in the lungs and overflow inflammation all over the body, what uh, physicians would refer to as systemic inflammations, which simply means body-wide inflammation, um, which you begin to see in seriously ill patients of COVID-19, that's the situation in which an anti-inflammatory steroid like dexamethasone seems to help most. Okay. So this is really not a magic bullet that it sort of solves the problem of uh, COVID-19. It's if you're really seriously ill, and again, this is your body reacting to the uh, COVID-19 infection, in which case, of course, what you were saying is this, this are the kind of things, symptoms you would see, and these are the kind of patients in which it has the most effect. But again, the most we are talking about is, is relatively, say, 15% to 17% improvement in the mortality rate, which is significant. We have nothing otherwise. Uh, as of now, not really too much. But that's the kind of figures we're talking about. It's not that all the, uh, it's a one in eight, not that all the eight get cured. So that's, that is also the other part. Of it. Absolutely. And um, let me underline this. This is not a new drug, but it's not simply not a new drug. This modality of treatment is not a new discovery. Yes. In fact, I'm told that a lot of the hospitals are already using uh, corticosteroids for this kind it of... It would astonish me if everybody was not already using corticosteroids in at least some patients severely ill with COVID-19. Okay. Not simply that. For the past decades, there has been an ongoing uh, investigation, debate, um, and, and uh, um, exploration about the role of corticosteroids in a whole range of both viral and bacterial infections that lead to body-wide inflammation. Okay. Um, the body-wide inflammation uh, being called septic shock. Okay, that's what is called septic shock. Okay. And um, in a certain sense, the most severely ill patients of COVID-19, remember that we have referred to their situation as being caused by something called a cytokine storm, is essentially a, a kind of septic shock. And, and for our hearers, our people who are watching us, cytokine storm is the one which really was the major killer in the influenza uh, epidemic of 1980. And this is the, one of the key killers also in this particular case. Storms are in fact, as I said, what kill severely ill patients in a whole range of bacterial infections. So the use of corticosteroids has always been attempted, tried, debated, worried over. So the worried over part is interesting. And it's interesting because the Oxford press release actually provides an entry point for that. Note that what the Oxford press release points out is that they are using a low dose regimen of dexamethasone for 10 days. Okay. And the significance of this is to do with the fact that dexamethasone, like all other corticosteroids, tends to reduce inflammation. But inflammation is the body's and the immune system's way of containing infection. So, so if you really want to reduce. control inflammation completely, and as a matter of fact, in a variety of local uh, applications of dexamethasone in the eye, in the nose, and so on and so forth, a major worry quite frequently is that prolonged high dosage use will lead to uncontested infections in that location because you are uh, shut down immune inflammation. So and effectively, you are controlling it, the, the immune storm, so to say,
but you don't want to take away the immune response altogether because if you do, then of course the infection persists. So this is why the low dose regimen is an interesting uh, um, um, wrinkle in the in in the story. Okay. And um, uh, there have again, it's not new. There is extensive literature that low dose. Uh, dexamethasone or its relative regimens in situations of severely ill patients with infections um, does not suppress anti-infective properties, okay. whether or not it suppresses inflammation enough to give clinical utility or not. Okay. So this is really one of those trials where an a sort of expected but carefully um, metered intervention has been tried in the public good in a what seems to be a very well done trial and has resulted in a reasonably reliable outcome that can be applied at least in one section of patients severely ill with COVID. Uh, Sadhvi, that's an interesting issue also because what you said was one of the arguments given initially, not later, that steroids may not be good because that may in fact reduce our immune response to the virus and that may in fact help the virus to take you know, control of the patient, so to say. So later on it was said, no, no, that's not such a big issue and so on. But that was initially one of the arguments about steroids. That, oh, absolutely, yes. Which is why I'm pointing out that the regimen that is being used in the low dose trial regimen. is actually a regimen that independent of COVID-19 has been tried in other infections and inflammations and has been sort of shown not to affect anti-infective bodily responses too much and therefore has been argued to be sort of, oh, this is safe enough that if you try this and if it helps inflammation, it'll be really useful. Now, two other medicines. One is Remdesivir, which we have talked about. Experimental medicine, virtually, because the trials are still, as, as you said, some no scientific results have come in the sense of a paper or even a preprint. It's only, again, a press release. But Remdesivir is expensive. Even in Bangladesh, which is... Uh, now producing it, it's sixty-five dollars a dose, and that's what I'm told is the price. And, and we are and we are forbidden to import it from Bangladesh. We are forbidden to import it from Bangladesh, and we do, we are not producing it here either. Nor has a compulsory licensing uh, procedure started. So that's well, we, are, we are not producing it because apparently, apparently, the four companies that are ready, willing, and able to produce it are not being given the necessary approval paperwork to, 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 to produce it. So companies are ready, but the government has not given them permission. Is, is the the in, in the public sphere. And again, the question, of course, there is, there is the sort of under compulsory license. Gilead has actually allowed them. Is it a collaboration? Yes. Okay. So that is one. But again, it's, if it's a Bangladesh price, it's still going to be expensive. Unlike dexamethasone, which is really very cheap. The third, again, which is also an anti-inflammatory, tocilizumab, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, that's, uh, that's also being tried and it's, it seems to have given some good results. Which one? Tocilizumab. Oh, tocilizumab. Zumab. So one of those maps, therefore right. one of those so, maps. So in the first place, let's get something clear. We're talking about two separate categories of medications. Okay. One category is medication that actually interferes with the life cycle of the virus. Mm -hmm. The second is medication that doesn't do anything to the life cycle of the virus that affects, like we said about dexamethasone, inflammation in the body in response to the virus. So, um, remdesivir or the HIV-related drugs, lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, that were being tried earlier, are all medications that interfere with virus life cycle. They don't do anything to the inflammation. On the other hand, both um, dexamethasone and tocilizumab 
interfere with inflammation. They don't do anything to the virus life cycle. Virus life. So the body is left to its own devices to deal with the virus. Only reducing inflammation, especially body-wide inflammation, which is throwing multiple organ systems into disarray, that is reduced. Effectively, what these medications do is allow the patient to survive while their body deals with the virus. And you know, Sati, the tocilizumab is again being a monoclonal antibody. Again, a very expensive drug. It's an extremely expensive drug, especially in, in, in comparison with uh, um, dexamethasone. It is a drug that has to be given as an injection. Dexamethasone can be taken orally. Um, it's not a, an easy drug to manufacture, in, even under compulsory licensing, should such licensing be done. So, absolutely, there's no question that there is a difference. However, the fact of the matter is that dexamethasone is a sledgehammer. Okay. It will bring down a very wide range of inflammatory um, pathways. And if you use low doses, then all these pathways will be reduced to a relatively lower extent. Tocilizumab, on the other hand, is directed against one major inflammatory uh, pathway, the interleukin-6 pathway. It leaves other inflammatory pathways relatively untouched. And there are pros and cons of these two, what I'm calling a surgical knife approach of tocilizumab versus a sledgehammer approach of corticosteroids there'll be trade-offs um, in individual patient situations it, 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 and certainly enough, interesting enough tocilizumab is also being tried in the recovery trials of the oxford university yes and they have not reported positively on it as yet so Correct. there are some reports that yes it has some good uh, results but it doesn't seem to have as uh, significant a result at appears again i'm being cautious. the caveat there is yeah even for the oxford trial yeah, yeah. As much as for you, me, and our listeners, dexamethasone is cheaper than tocilizumab. Absolutely. And therefore, I have a very strong suspicion. I, I will. I, I. I might well turn out to be to be wrong. But I have a very strong suspicion that it would not be surprising if the number of patients recruited in the dexamethasone arm has so far been much larger than the number of patients successfully recruited in the tocilizumab bar. <laughs> so I don't think that we can very easily make these conclusions. What we can see is it's actually in thousands. So that's, that's much larger than what we would see, even with, you know, uh, remdesivir or with uh, tocilizumab. Yeah. tocilizumab but, even exactly, but exactly like dexamethasone, tocilizumab has also been reported over the past three months to give no harmful effects and in some reports some gain in some reports not a lot of gain but none of those are this systematic clinical trial which will give reliable and robust so you have, you've been holding for a long time the argument that remdesivir would kind of medication would help in the initial phase but once it's really taken hold of the body then it really doesn't lead to significant differences and that is what we also found that remdesivir didn't really reduce the end point, which it is one of the end points, which was reduction of deaths. But this particular application, dexamethasone, seems to have helped with that end point. Made the distinction between two categories of medications, one interfering with the virus life cycle, one interfering with uh, the inflammation. If you don't have a lot of inflammation, then uh, medications that, in, uh, that reduce inflammation are not of any use. Terribly indicated even, leave alone be, being useful. So clearly, if, you, if all you have is a dry cough and a bit of fever for a few days, you don't want to be taking dexamethasone at all. Regardless of whether it works to reduce your cough by one day or not, you really don't want to be taking Absolutely. dexamethasone. On the other hand, uh, you point out, uh, I have been saying this earlier, that interfering with the virus life cycle in the late stages of body-wide inflammation-driven sickness, 
may not give a huge advantage. And that's what you pointed to. But let me point out that if we look at it from the point of view of an epidemic, then the number of days that an infected patient remains infectious and transmits virus is of great concern from the public health point of view. Okay. And from that point of view, I would be very anxious to look at the reduction in the period of infectivity with antiviral drugs in mildly symptomatic individuals. Okay. And so, if we can achieve that, and if we can compulsory license an effective drug in that situation, then we will not be, you're perfectly right, interfering with um, the death of a severely ill patient, I admit. But we might actually prevent fairly large numbers of people from dying simply because we are interfering with the transmission efficiency. Of the virus. Effectively, less people get infected there okay. than the chances of people getting more seriously infected also reduce. Therefore, the benefit. So, according to you, even if it is not that effective in seriously infected patients, seriously affected patients, it still remains a drug which could help us in fighting the epidemic. If we try it from that public health perspective, yes. view. Okay. So, good. We have two at least arrows in our uh, quiver at the moment for two different purposes, both having functions in the epidemic. So in one case, when will it be available in India? Other at least widely available. So we seem to be in a slightly better position with respect to drugs, provided, of course, we start manufacturing Remdesivir and sell, selling it in India. Thank you very All much. this, of course is purely at the level of news conferences. This is science and technology via news conferences, which has its own gains and losses. Thank you very much, Satyit, for being with us, sharing with our listeners uh, your views. This is all the time we have in NewsClick today. Do keep watching NewsClick.